In this video, we're going to begin our discussion of this new unit on thermodynamics by defining what thermodynamics actually is and talking about one of the main values we'll be discussing in here, which is known as enthalpy. Here's a quick list of the learning objectives we'll be covering in this video. I will first talk, start talking about heat in chemical reactions, something we really haven't been keeping track of so far this year. Uh, we'll then define that with some terminology here, discussing our main term of the day, which is the idea of enthalpy, which we'll later be discussing with this variable, delta H. Uh, we can then further define enthalpy reactions as being either endothermic, or as being exothermic, and we'll talk about what those terms mean and how we'll use them. Uh, we'll define systems. Uh, you actually should have some experience doing this back from your physics class, what's happening in your system versus what's happening in the surroundings. And last but not least, all of that will get folded up into a uh, graph that we can draw, uh, which will be known as enthalpy diagrams. So let's begin with a quick definition of what thermodynamics actually is. Basically what thermodynamics is is how heat energy is used and or moves in our universe. Uh, you'll notice I haven't said anything really about chemistry here, and that's because thermodynamics by itself is specifically a physics topic. It's broader than what we would cover here in chemistry. Uh, we'll be learning a little bit of thermodynamics, uh, but we'll also be learning a little bit of thermochemistry. And just like... Thermodynamics covers everything in the universe and more as a physics topic. Thermochemistry focuses specifically on thermodynamics that happens during chemical reactions, and that's definitely more of a chemistry topic. But again, we'll be tackling a little bit of both here in this chapter. What thermodynamics covers, and as I've already mentioned up here, the idea of heat, uh, we can come up with an official definition. Now, unfortunately, heat's one of those words that we use in common day language, and our definition from what that is versus what we talk about in science classes can be a little bit different. Uh, heat is primarily a form of kinetic energy. If you recall from your physics classes, kinetic energy is the energy associated with movement. Uh, so as molecules move, the combined energies from that movement, translational energy, meaning moving from place to place, the molecules themselves, rotational energy, meaning the molecules are rotating, and vibrational energy, all those energies combined add up to make what we describe as our heat energy. Uh, and we feel this heat energy in the form of changes in temperature. And as we're going to talk later on in this chapter, heat and temperature are actually two very different things. Our body detects changes in temperature, and those changes in temperature are caused by heat moving from one place to another. But again, we'll tackle that question further on down the road. Last but not least, uh, the unit we use to measure heat is the unit of joules, or actually more commonly, we'll be dealing with kilojoules. A joule is a relatively small unit of energy. Kilojoules are a little bit more manageable. And what a joule is, is the energy needed to exert the force of one newton on an object over the distance of one meter. And if you talk about forces acting over meters, you're really talking about work. And joules are going to be used to measure work as well as heat energy itself. And we'll tie those two together a little later on in this discussion. So let's get a little more specific now and talk about how heat energy is then used in chemical reactions. Uh, when a chemical reaction runs, two things happen. We get bonds breaking and new bonds forming. And this process of breaking and forming bonds is what forms new chemical products from our original reactants. What we have not talked about in this so, so far this year, which is really what today's all about, is that energy is absorbed when you form bonds or released when you break bonds during this process. Therefore, any excess or deficits in energy, i.e. I created, I released too much energy by breaking bonds or I didn't make use up enough energy by forming bonds, any excess or deficit in this reaction means that energy is absorbed from released from the reaction system itself. This means basically that heat is going to come out of the reaction or heat is going to go into your reaction. And we can feel that, again, in the form of temperature changes. All of this happens because of something we're already very familiar with, and that is the I All of this happens because of something we're very familiar with, and that is the idea of conservation of energy. Just like we had conservation of matter, conservation of energy says that energy is never gained or lost in a closed system. Therefore, if our chemical reaction doesn't use up all the energy it released by breaking bonds, that energy has to go somewhere, and it typically gets released in the form of heat or as we'll talk about in a minute, it can be released in the form of work.
So what I have here then is a couple chemical reactions that we can talk about this with. Uh, this first chemical reaction here is the combustion of the substance methane. And when we combust methane, we break the bonds in CH4, and we break the bonds in O2. And as a result of that, the chemicals or the atoms here recombine, and we form new bonds here, and we form new bonds here to make our water. By breaking the bonds, we're overall releasing energy. And then some of that energy that we released is then used to form the bonds here. However, we gave out more energy release than was used, and as a result, there is an excess amount of heat left over that's given off as a product. We would describe this reaction as giving off heat. If you look over here, we can clearly see that this is the combustion reaction, the combustion of methane, and we're generally used to combustion reactions feeling hot, and they feel hot because they've given off heat energy as a product. Again, because the products didn't use as much energy as was released by the reactants, the excess comes off in the form of heat. Down here, the opposite's going on. We have liquid H2O reacting to form gaseous H2O. Uh, this requires the introduction of extra heat in the process. And if you think about this, we're really just boiling water here. Uh, and as a result, we know we have to heat water up to boil in there. When we take the energy present in liquid water, when we add in heat energy, we end up with the new product of gaseous water. Now, I know no bonds are being broken and formed here, but the same general concept applies. So I guess what we can say here is that we can either expect to see our heat showing up as a product in the reaction, or we can end up seeing our heat showing up as a reactant, just like we see chemicals showing up as products or reactants. Now that we got the general ideas in place, it's time to start attaching some more specific vocabulary. And the big terminology that's going to show up in this chapter is the idea of enthalpy. Uh, what enthalpy is is a measure of the total energy that's present in a system. And the symbol that we use for enthalpy, or enthalpy sorry, is the capital letter H. Unfortunately, enthalpy is impossible to measure. You'd have to measure the kinetic energy, the potential energy, and work that is done by each molecule at each moment in time, and that's just not something we can keep up with. We can't make those number of measurements, because keep in mind, even in small samples, we're talking about billions and billions of molecules, not just a small number of things. Instead of trying to measure enthalpy directly, what we're usually more interested in is measuring changes in energy. How much heat energy is gained or lost during a system, and refer to this with the symbol delta H, delta being the symbol for change. This value can be measured, and it's measured as the amount of heat that is moved and or work done by a chemical system, and we can see this via changes in temperature. So even though we can't figure out how much enthalpy a system has, we can't figure out what changes occur to that enthalpy by keeping track of changes in temperature. Uh, this can be quantified, meaning we can write down a number as the amount of heat and work that's gained or lost in a system. And we talk about delta H typically in the units of kilojoules per mole of chemical that's actually reacted. So now that we've identified the idea of enthalpy, we can be a little bit more specific. And we can describe the enthalpy of different reactions in two different ways, as being endothermic or as being exothermic. An exothermic reaction is a chemical reaction that releases excess energy in the form of heat. More energy is released in the process of breaking bonds than is used in the process of forming bonds. And that excess energy has to go somewhere, so it is released from the reaction into the surroundings. This type of reaction feels hot to us. As the heat comes out of the reaction, it has to go somewhere. If you're holding onto the flask, the heat goes into your hand. The temperature of the skin rises, and that our body senses as something that feels hot. Now, what's important here is that reactions that are described as exothermic have negative values for delta H. We apply a negative sign simply to show that heat is coming out of the reaction as opposed to going in. This was a sign that was chosen. I don't know if there's really some significant mathematics, but at some point in time, someone had to decide which sign meant what, and they decided that exothermic means negative. So it's what's known as a sign convention.
The opposite then is an endothermic reaction. This is a chemical reaction that absorbs heat energy from its surroundings. There is more energy needed to make the products, which is the forming of the bonds, than is available from breaking down the reactants, in this case, the breaking of the bonds. To make up that deficit, energy is pulled from the outside. If you're holding the flask, that energy is pulled out of you, and as a result, these reactions will feel cold to the touch. The sign convention then, as you might imagine, for delta H values that are endothermic is a positive value of delta H. So let's do this a little more graphically here. Uh, I've got a picture of what we'll describe here as the system. Uh, the system, for example, could be the beaker with your, with your reaction in it. And then the surroundings is all the space around that. In this particular scenario, if you can imagine this reaction as releasing heat energy to its surroundings, so heat is coming out of the reaction because there is excess of it, we would describe this reaction as being exothermic. The energy released by breaking bonds is greater than the energy needed to put new bonds together, and the excess energy gets released to the surroundings, and we would say that the delta H of a reaction like this would be a negative value. Apply that to an actual chemical reaction then, and here we have the combustion of methane again, which we described as releasing heat. We now know that releasing heat means exothermic, but this is kind of a crude way of going about doing this. Instead, we're going to replace the word heat with a value for delta H, and we get a new chemical reaction that looks like this. You've got the chemistry or the, the, the matter part of the reaction happening over here, and then off to the side, we can see the energy part as, uh, as a side part here. The negative value here means it is exothermic, and this value here tells us how much heat energy is being given off. In this case, 802 kilojoules is a relatively large amount. CH4, or burning of methane, can be used as a fuel source because it does give off heat energy. And seeing a big value here for the delta H is not too surprising. Let's go back to our diagram from before and describe the other half of the scenario. In this situation, when we break our chemical bonds, it doesn't give off enough energy to form the new bonds. And as a result, this reaction is going to pull in heat energy from the outside to make up that deficit. It's going to pull in the heat energy needed to form those new chemical bonds in the product. And as a result of that, we would say that this reaction is endothermic. It's going to feel cold, and we would expect it to have a delta H value that is positive. We'll go back to the reaction we used in this example before. H2O absorbs heat energy to make H2O gas. Again, we talked about the fact that this is a crude way of doing it. We can instead write the reaction like before. H2O liquid going to H2O gas. Here is the matter part of the reaction. And over here, here is the energy part of the reaction. The positive sign again denoting that it is endothermic and the 40 being the magnitude of how endothermic the reaction is. So this reaction is going to absorb 40 kilojoules of energy for every mole of water that we want to convert from a liquid to a gas. And these will be numbers that we can actually do math with a little later on in the chapter. So that's pretty much it for today. Uh, just to get us started with the thinking process here, at this stage in the game, you should be able to describe what heat energy is and how it fits into this bigger world of thermochemistry and thermodynamics. Uh, you should be able to describe how heat energy is used during chemical reaction. It's either used, uh, it's either given off as an excess when the reaction uh, has released more energy than it needs to put the products together, or it's absorbed from the surroundings when the reaction needs more energy than is given to it uh, to form the products. And last but not least, you should be able to express the amount of heat energy gained or loss as a value of delta H, keeping in mind that the sign for delta H is important and the magnitude of delta H is important as well. These are not values that you can come up with on your own yet. Delta H values will be given to you for the first part of the chapter. In the second half of the chapter, we'll talk about where these delta H values actually come from. They can either be calculated or measured, but that is a story for another day.